Chapter 32 Twelve days later, in the afternoon, the courier from Osaka arrived. An escort of ten samurai rode in with him. Their horses were lathered and near death. The flags at their spearheads carried the cipher of the all-powerful Council of Regents. It was hot, overcast, and humid. The courier was a lean, hard samurai of senior rank, one of Ishido's chief lieutenants. His name was Nebra Josen, and he was known for his ruthlessness. His gray uniform kimono was tattered and mud-stained, his eyes red with fatigue. He refused food or drink and impolitely demanded an immediate audience with Yabu. Forgive my appearance, Yabu-san, but my business is urgent, he said. Yes, I ask your pardon. My master says first, why do you train Toronaga's soldiers along with your own and second, why do they drill with so many guns? Yabu had flushed at the rudeness but he kept his temper, knowing that Josen would have had specific instructions and that such lack of manners bespoke an untoward position of power. And two, he was greatly unsettled that there had been another leak in his security. You're very welcome, Josen san You may assure your master that I always have his interests at heart, he said with a courteousness that fooled no one present. They were on the veranda of the fortress. Omi sat just behind Yabu. Igurashi, who had been forgiven a few days before, was nearer to Josen and surrounding them were intimate guards. What else does your master say? Josen replied. My master will be glad that your interests are his. Now, about the guns and the training, my master would like to know why Toranaga's son, Naga, is second in command. Second in command of what? What's so important that a Toranaga son should be here? The Lord General Ishido asks with politeness. That's of interest to him. Yes. Everything his allies do interests him. Why is it, for instance, the barbarian seems to be in charge of training? Training of what? Yes, Jabusama, that's very interesting also. Josen shifted his swords more comfortably, glad that his back was protected by his own men. Next, the Council of Regents meets again on the first day of the new moon. In twenty days. You are formally invited to Osaka to renew your oath of fidelity. Yabu's stomach twisted. I understood Toranaga-sama had resigned? He has, Yabu-san, indeed he has. But Lord Ito Terazumi's taking his place. My master will be the new president of the regents. Yabu was panic-stricken. Toranaga had said that the four regents could never agree on a fifth. Ido Terazumi was a minor daimyo of Nagato province in western Honshu but his family was ancient, descended from Fujimoto lineage, so he would be acceptable as a regent, though he was an ineffectual man, effeminate, and a puppet. I would be honored to receive their invitation, Yabu said defensively, trying to buy time to think. My master thought you might wish to leave at once. Then you would be in Osaka for the formal meeting. He orders me to tell you all the daimyos are getting the same invitation. Now. So all will have an opportunity to be there in good time on the twenty-first day. A flower. Viewing ceremony has been authorized by His Imperial Highness, Emperor Gonijo, to honor the occasion. Josen offered an official scroll. This isn't under the seal of the Council of Regents. My master has issued the invitation now, knowing that. As a loyal vassal of the late Tycho, as a loyal vassal of Yemen, his son and heir and the rightful ruler of the empire when he becomes of age, you will understand that the new council will, of course, approve his action. Nay, it would certainly be a privilege to witness the formal meeting. Yabu struggled to control his face. Good, Josen said. He pulled out another scroll, opened it, and held it up. This is a copy of Lord Ito's letter of appointment, accepted and signed and authorized by the other regents, Lords Ishido, Kiyama, Onoshir, and the Lord Sudiyama. Josen did not bother to conceal a triumphant look, knowing that this totally closed the trap on Toranaga and any of his allies, and that equally the scroll made him and his men invulnerable. Yabu took the scroll. His fingers trembled. 
There was no doubt of its authenticity. It had been countersigned by the Lady Yudoko, the wife of the Tycho, who affirmed that the document was true and signed in her presence, one of six copies that were being sent throughout the empire, and that this particular copy was for the lords of Iwari, Mikawa, Tatami, Sugura, Aizu, and the Quanto. It was dated eleven days ago. The lords of Iwari, Mikawa, Suruga and Tatami have already accepted. Here are their seals. You're the last but one on my list. Last is the Lord Torinaga. Please thank your master and tell him I look forward to greeting him and congratulating him, Yabu said. Good. I'll require it in writing. Now would be satisfactory. This evening, Josen san After the evening meal. Very well. And now we can go and see the training. There is none today. All my men are on forced marches, Yabu said. The moment Josen and his men had entered Aizu, word had been rushed to Yabu, who had at once ordered his men to cease all firing and to continue only silent weapon training well away from Anjiro. Tomorrow you can come with me at noon if you wish. Josen looked at the sky. It was late afternoon now. Good. I could use a little sleep. But I'll come back at dusk, with your permission. Then you and your commander, Omi-san, and the second commander, Naga-san, will tell me, for my master's interests, about the training, the guns, and everything. And about the barbarian. He's yes. Of course. Yabu motioned to Igurashi. Arrange quarters for our honored guests and his men. Thank you, but that's not necessary, Josen said at once. The ground's futon enough for a samurai, my saddle's pillow enough. Just a bath, if you please. This humidity, nay? I'll camp on the crest, of course, with your permission. As you wish. Josen bowed stiffly and walked away, surrounded by his men. All were heavily armed. Two bowmen had been left holding their horses. Once they were well away, Yabu's face contorted with rage. Who betrayed me? Who? Where's the spy? Equally ashen, Igarashi waved the guards out of earshot. Yido, sire, he said. Must be. Security's perfect here. Okayo, Yabu said, almost rending his clothes. I'm betrayed. We're isolated. Aiza and the Quanto are isolated. Ishido's one. He's one, Omi said quickly. Not for twenty days, sire. Send a message at once to Lord Toranaga. Inform him that, fool. Yabu hissed. Of course Toranaga already knows. Where I've one spy he has fifty. He's left me in the trap. I don't think so, sire, Omi said unafraid. Iwari, Mikawa, Tatami, and Sugura are all hostile to him, nay? And to anyone who's allied to him. They never warn him so perhaps he doesn't know yet. Inform him and suggest, didn't you hear? Yabu shouted. All four regents agree to Ito's appointment, so the council's legal again, and the council meets in twenty days. The answer to that is simple, sire. Suggest to Toranaga that he have Ito Terazumi or one of the other regents assassinated at once. Yabu's mouth dropped open. What? If you don't wish to do that, send me, let me try. Origarashi san With Lord Ito dead, Ishido's helpless again. I don't know whether you've gone mad, or what, Yabu said helplessly. Do you understand what you've just said? Sire, I beg you, please, to be patient with me. The Anjin san's given you priceless knowledge, nay? More than we ever dreamed possible. Now Toranaga knows this also, through your reports, and probably from Naga-san's private reports. If we can win enough time, our five hundred guns and the other three hundred will give you absolute battle power, but only once. When the enemy, whoever he is, sees the way you use men and firepower they'll learn quickly. But they'll have lost that first battle. One battle if it's the right battle will give Toranaga total victory. Ishido doesn't need any battle. In twenty days he has the emperor's mandate. Ishido's a peasant. 
He's the son of a peasant, a liar, and he runs away from his comrades in battle. Yabu stared at Omi, his face mottled. You do you know what you're saying? That's what he did in Korea. I was there. I saw it, my father saw it. Ishido did leave Buntaro-san and us to fight our own way out. He's just a treacherous peasant, the taiko S dog, certainly. You can't trust peasants. But Torunaga's Minoira. You can trust him. I advise you to consider only Torunaga's interests. Yabu shook his head in disbelief. Are you deaf? Didn't you hear Nebra Josen? Ishido's one. The council is in power in twenty days. May be in power. Even if Ito. How could you? It's not possible. Certainly I could try but I could never do it in time. None of us could, not in twenty days. But Torunaga could. Omi knew he had put himself into the jaws of the dragon. I beg you to consider it. Jabu wiped his face with his hands, his body wet. After this summons, if the council is convened and I'm not present, I and all my clan are dead, you included. I need two months, at least, to train the regiment. Even if we had them trained now, Toranaga and I could never win against all the others. No, you're wrong, I have to support Ishido. Omi said, You don't have to leave for Osaka for ten days fourteen, if you go by force march. Tell Toranaga about Nebra Josen at once. You'll save Aizu and the Kasiji house. I beg you. Ishido will betray you and eat you up. Ikawa Jiku is his kinsman, nay? But what about Josen? Igarashi exclaimed. Eh? And the guns? The grand strategy? He wants to know about everything tonight. Tell him. In detail. What is he but a lackey? Omi said, beginning to maneuver them. He knew he was risking everything, but he had to try to protect Yabu from siding with Ishido and ruining any chance they had. Open your plans to him. Igarashi disagreed heatedly. The moment Josen learns what we're doing, he'll send a message back to Lord Ishido. It's too important not to. Ishido will steal the plans, then we're finished. We trail the messenger and kill him at our convenience. Yabu flushed. That scroll was signed by the highest authority in the land. They all travel under the regent's protection. You must be mad to suggest such a thing. That would make me an outlaw. Omi shook his head, keeping confidence on his face. I believe Yudoko Sama and the others have been duped, as his imperial highness has been duped by the traitor Ishido. We must protect the guns, sire. We must stop any messenger. Silence. Your advice is madness. Omi bowed under the tongue lash. But he looked up and said calmly, Then please allow me to commit seppuku, sire. But first, please allow me to finish. I would fail in my duty if I didn't try to protect you. I beg this last favor as a faithful vassal. Finish. There's no council of regents now, so there is no legal protection now for that insulting, foul manner Josen and his men. Unless you honor an illegal document through. Omi was going to say. Weakness. But he changed the word and kept his voice quietly authoritative. Through being duped like the others, sire. There is no counsel. They cannot order you to do anything, or anyone. Once it's convened, yes, they can, and then you will have to obey. But now, how many daimyos will obey before legal orders can be issued? Only Ishido's allies, nay? Arndawari, Mikawa, Tatami, and Sugura all ruled by his kinsmen and allied to him openly? That document absolutely means war, yes, but I beg you to wage it on your terms and not Ishido's. Treat this threat with the contempt it deserves. Torunaga's never been beaten in battle. Ishido has. Torunaga avoided being part of the Taiko's ruinous attack on Korea. Ishido didn't. Torunaga's in favor of ships and trade. Ishido isn't. Torunaga will want the barbarian's navy, didn't you advocate it to him? Ishido won't. Ishido will close the empire. Torunaga will keep it open. Ishido will give Ikawa Jiki a hereditary fief of Aizu if he wins. 
Torunaga will give you all Jiku's province. Your Torunaga's chief ally didn't he give you his sword? Hasn't he given you control of the guns? Don't the guns guarantee one victory, with surprise? What does the peasant Ishido give in return? He sends a ronin samurai with no manners, with deliberate orders to shame you in your own province. I say Torunaga Minoera is your only choice. You must go with him. He bowed and waited in silence. Yabu glanced at Igarashi. Well? I agree with Omisan, sire. Igarashi's face mirrored his worry. As to killing a messenger that would be dangerous, no turning back then, sire. Josen will certainly send one or two tomorrow. Perhaps they could vanish, killed by bandits. He stopped in mid-sentence. Carrier pigeons! There were two panniers of them on Josen's pack horses. We'll have to poison them tonight, Omi said. How? They'll be guarded. I don't know. But they've got to be removed or maimed before dawn, Yabu said. Igarashi, send men to watch Josen at once. See if he sends one of his pigeons now today. I suggest you send all our falcons and falconers to the east, also at once, Omi added quickly. Igarashi said. He'll suspect treachery if he sees his bird downed, or his birds tampered with. Omi shrugged. It must be stopped. Igarashi looked at Yabu. Yabu nodded resignedly. Do it. When Igarashi came back he said, Omi-san, one thing occurred to me. A lot of what you said was right, about Jikyu and Lord Ishido. But if you advise making the messengers vanish, why toy with Josen at all? Why tell him anything? Why not just kill them all at once? Why not indeed? Unless it might amuse Yabusama. I agree your plans better, Igarashin, Omi said. Both men were looking at Yabu now. How can I keep the gun secret? He asked them. Kill Josen and his men, Omi replied. No other way? Omi shook his head. Igarashi shook his head. Maybe I could barter with Ishido, Yabu said, shaken, trying to think of a way out of the trap. You're correct about the time. I've ten days, fourteen at the most. How to deal with Josen and still leave time to maneuver? It would be wise to pretend that you're going to Osaka, Omi said. But there's no harm in informing Toronaga at once, nay? One of our pigeons could get to Yido before dusk. Perhaps. No harm in that, Igarashi said. You could tell Lord Toronaga about Josen arriving, and about the council meeting in twenty days, yes. But the other, about assassinating Lord Ito, that's too dangerous to put in writing even if. Much too dangerous, nay? I agree. Nothing about Ito. Torinaga should think of that himself. It's obvious, nay? Yes, sire. Unthinkable but obvious. Omi waited in the silence, his mind frantically seeking a solution. Jabu's eyes were on him, but he was not afraid. His advice had been sound and offered only for the protection of the clan and the family and Yabu, the present leader of the clan. That Omi had decided to remove Yabu and change the leadership had not prevented him from counseling Yabu sagaciously. And he was prepared to die now. If Yabu was so stupid as not to accept the obvious truth of his ideas, then there soon would be no clan to lead anyway. Karma Yabu leaned forward, still undecided. Is there any way to remove Josen and his men without danger to me, and stay uncommitted for ten days? Naga. Somehow bait a trap with Naga, Omi said simply. At dusk, Blackthorn and Mariko rode up to the gate of his house, outriders following. Both were tired. She rode as a man would ride, wearing loose trousers and over them a belted mantle. She had on a wide-brimmed hat and gloves to protect her from the sun. Even peasant women tried to protect their faces and their hands from the rays of the sun. From time immemorial, the darker the skin the more common the person, the whiter the more prized. Male servants took the halters and led the horses away. Blackthorn dismissed his outriders in tolerable Japanese and greeted Fujiko, who waited proudly on the veranda as usual. 
May I serve you cha Anjin san? She said ceremoniously, as usual, and? No, he said as usual. First I will bathe. Then sake and some food. And, as usual, he returned her bow and went through the corridor to the back of the house, out into the garden, along the circling path to the mud-waddled bathhouse. A servant took his clothes and he went in and sat down naked. Another servant scrubbed him and soaked him and shampooed him and poured water over him to wash away the lather and the dirt. Then, completely clean, gradually because the water was so hot he stepped into the huge iron-sided bath and lay down. Christ Jesus, that's grand, he exulted, and let the heat seep into his muscles, his eyes closed, the sweat running down his forehead. He heard the door open and Suo's voice and, Good evening, master, followed by many words of Japanese which he did not understand. But tonight he was too tired to try to converse with Suo. And the bath, as Mariko had explained many times, is not merely for cleaning the skin. The bath is a gift to us from God or the gods, a God bequeathed pleasure to be enjoyed and treated as such. No talk, Suo, he said. Tonight wish think. Yes, master. Your pardon, but you should say, tonight I wish to think. Tonight I wish to think. Blackthorn repeated the correct Japanese, trying to get the almost incomprehensible sounds into his head, glad to be corrected but very weary of it. Where's the dictionary grammar book? He had asked Mariko first thing this morning. Has Yabusama sent another request for it? Yes. Please be patient, Anjin-san. It will arrive soon. It was promised with the galley and the troops. It didn't arrive. Troops and guns but no books. I'm lucky you're here. It'd be impossible without you. Difficult, but not impossible, Anjin-san. How do I say, no, you're doing it wrong? You must all run as a team, stop as a team, aim and fire as a team? To whom are you talking, Anjin-san? She had asked. And then again he had felt his frustration rising. It's all very difficult, Mariko-san. Oh no, Anjin-san. Japanese is very simple to speak compared with other languages. There are no articles, no the a or an. No verb conjugations or infinitives. All verbs are regular, ending in masu, and you can say almost everything by using the present tense only, if you want. For a question just add ka after the verb. For a negative, just change masu to mazen. What could be easier? Yukimasa means I go, but equally you, he, she, it, we, they go, or will go, or even could have gone. Even plural and singular nouns are the same. Suma means wife, or wives. Very simple. Well, how do you tell the difference between I go, yukimasu, and they went, yukimasu? By inflection, anjin-san, and tone. Listen, yukimasa, yukimasa. But these both sounded exactly the same. Ah, uh, Anjin-san, that's because you're thinking in your own language. To understand Japanese, you have to think Japanese. Don't forget our language is the language of the infinite. It's all so simple, Anjin-san. Just change your concept of the world. Japanese is just learning a new art, detached from the world. It's all so simple. It's all shit. He had muttered in English and felt better. What? What did you say? Nothing. But what you say doesn't make sense. Learn the written characters, Bariko had said. I can't. It'll take too long. They're meaningless. Look, they're really simple pictures, Anjin San. The Chinese are very clever. We borrowed their writing a thousand years ago. Look, take this character or symbol for a pig. It doesn't look like a pig. Once it did, Anjin San. Let me show you. Here. Add a roof symbol over a pig symbol, and what do you have? A pig and a roof. But what does that mean? The new character? I don't know. Home. In the olden days, the Chinese thought a pig under a roof was home. They're not Buddhists, they're meat eaters, so a pig to them. To peasants, represented wealth, hence a good home. Hence the character. But how do you say it? 
That depends if you're Chinese or Japanese. Okeo. Okeo, indeed. She had laughed. Here's another character. A roof symbol and a pig symbol and a woman symbol. A roof with two pigs under it means contentment. A roof with two women under it equals discord. Nay. Absolutely. Of course, the Chinese are very stupid in many things and their women are not trained as women are here. There's no discord in your home, is there? Blackthorn thought about that now, on the twelfth day of his rebirth. No. There was no discord. But neither was it a home. Fujiko was only like a trustworthy housekeeper and tonight when he went to his bed to sleep, the futons would be turned back and she would be kneeling beside them patiently, expressionlessly. She would be dressed in her sleeping kimono, which was similar to a day kimono but softer and with only a loose sash instead of a stiff obi at the waist. Thank you, lady, he would say. Good night. She would bow and go silently to the room across the corridor, next to the one Mariko slept in. Then he would get under the fine silk mosquito net. He had never known such nets before. Then he would lie back happily, and in the night, hearing the few insects buzzing outside, he would dwell on the black ship, how important the black ship was to Japan. Without the Portuguese, no trade with China. And no silks for clothes or for nets. Even now, with the humidity only just beginning, he knew their value. If he stirred in the night a maid would open the door almost instantly to ask if there was anything he wanted. Once he had not understood. He motioned the maid away and went to the garden and sat on the steps, looking at the moon. Within a few minutes Fujiko, tousled and bleary, came and sat silently behind him. Can I get you anything, lord? No, thank you. Please go to bed. She had said something he did not understand. Again he had motioned her away so she spoke sharply to the maid, who attended her like a shadow. Soon Mariko came. Are you all right, Anjin-san? Yes. I don't know why you were disturbed. Christ Jesus, I'm just looking at the moon. I couldn't sleep. I just wanted some air. Fujiko spoke to her haltingly, ill at ease hurt by the irritation in his voice. She says you told her to go back to sleep. She just wanted you to know that it's not our custom for a wife or consort to sleep while her master's awake, that's all, Anjin-san. Then she'll have to change her custom. I'm often up at night. By myself. It's a habit from being at sea I sleep very lightly ashore. Yes, Anjin-san. Mariko had explained and the two women had gone away. But Blackthorn knew that Fujiko had not gone back to sleep and would not until he slept. She was always up and waiting whatever time he came back to the house. Some nights he walked the shore alone. Even though he insisted on being alone, he knew that he was followed and watched. Not because they were afraid he was trying to escape. Only because it was their custom for important people always to be attended. In Anjiro he was important. In time he accepted her presence. It was as Mariko had first said, think of her as a rock or a shoji or a wall. It is her duty to serve you. It was different with Mariko. He was glad that she had stayed. Without her presence he could never have begun the training, let alone explain the intricacies of strategy. He blessed her and Father Domingo and Albin Karadoc and his other teachers. I never thought the battles would ever be put to good use, he thought again. Once when his ship was carrying a cargo of English wools to Antwerp, a Spanish army had swooped down upon the city and every man had gone to the barricades and to the dikes. The sneak attack had been beaten off and the Spanish infantry outgunned and outmaneuvered. That was the first time he had seen William, Duke of Orange, using regiments like chess pieces. Advancing, retreating in pretended panic to regroup again, charging back again, guns blazing in pact, gut hurting, ear pounding salvos, breaking through the invincibles to leave them dying and screaming, the stench of blood and powder and urine and horses and dung filling you. And a wild frantic joy of killing possessing you and the strength of twenty in your arms. Christ Jesus, 
It's grand to be victorious, he said aloud in the tub. Master? Sowa said. Nothing, he replied in Japanese. I talking I was just think just thinking aloud. I understand, master. Yes. Your pardon. Blackthorn let himself drift away. Mariko. Yes, she's been invaluable. After that first night of his almost suicide, nothing had ever been said again. What was there to say? I'm glad there's so much to do, he thought. No time to think except here in the bath for these few minutes. Never enough time to do everything. Ordered to concentrate on training and teaching and not on learning, but wanting to learn, trying to learn, needing to learn to fulfill the promise to Yabu. Never enough hours. Always exhausted and drained by bedtime, sleeping instantly, to be up at dawn and riding fast to the plateau. Training all morning, then a sparse meal, never satisfying and never meet. Then every afternoon until nightfall sometimes till very late at night with Yabu and Omi and Igarashi and Naga and Zukimoto and a few of the other officers, talking about war, answering questions about war. How to wage war. How barbarians. War and how Japanese war. On land and at sea. Scribes always taking notes. Many, many notes. Sometimes with Yabu alone. But always Mariko there part of him talking for him. And for Yabu. Mariko different now toward him. He no longer a stranger. Other days the scribes reading back the notes. Always checking, being meticulous. Revising and checking again until now. After twelve days and a hundred hours or so of detailed exhaustive explanation. A war manual was forming. Exact. And lethal. Lethal to whom? Not to us English or Hollanders, who will come here peacefully and only as traitors. Lethal to Yabu's enemies and to Toranaga's enemies, and to our Portuguese and Spanish enemies when they try to conquer Japan. Like they've done everywhere else, in every newly discovered territory. First the priests arrive, then the conquistadores. But not here, he thought with great contentment. Never here now. The manual's lethal and proof against that. No conquest here, given a few years for the knowledge to spread. Anjin-san? Hi, Mariko-san? She was bowing to him. Yabukeo wa kidin no gashasiki o konya wa hetsuyo to senu to ozereru, Anjin-san. The words formed slowly in his head. Lord Yabu does not require to see you tonight. Ichiban, he said blissfully. Domo. Gomen Nasai Anjin-san. Anatawa. Yes, Mariko-san. He interrupted her, the heat of the water sapping his energy. I know I should have said it differently, but I don't want to speak any more Japanese now. Not tonight. Now I feel like a school but who's been let out of school for the Christmas holiday. Do you realize these'll be the first free hours I've had since I arrived? Yes, yes I do. She smiled wryly. And do you realize, Senor Captain Pilot Brackfon, these will be the first free hours I've had since I arrived? He laughed. She was wearing a thick cotton bathing robe tied loosely, and a towel around her head to protect her hair. Every evening as soon as his massage began, she would take the bath, sometimes alone, sometimes with Fujiko. Here you have it now, he said, beginning to get out. Oh, please, no, I don't wish to disturb you. Then share it. It's wonderful. Thank you. I can hardly wait to soak the sweat and dust away. She took off her robe and sat on the tiny seat. A servant began to lather her, so we're waiting patiently near the massage table. It is rather like a school holiday, she said as happily. The first time Blackthorn had seen her naked on the day that they swam he had been greatly affected. Now her nakedness, of itself, did not touch him physically. Living closely in Japanese style in a Japanese house where the walls were paper and the rooms multipurpose, he had seen her unclothed and partially clothed many times. He had even seen her relieving herself. What's more normal, Anjin-san? Bodies are normal and differences between men and women are normal, nay? 
Yes, but it's, sir, just that we're trained differently. But now you're here and our customs are your customs and normal is normal. Nay. Normal was urinating or defecating in the open if there were no latrines or buckets, just lifting your kimono or parting it and squatting or standing, everyone else politely waiting and not watching, rarely screens for privacy. Why should one require privacy? And soon one of the peasants would gather the feces and mix it with water to fertilize crops. Human manure and urine were the only substantial source of fertilizer in the empire. There were few horses and bullocks, and no other animal sources at all. So every human particle was harbored and sold to the farmers throughout the land. And after you've seen the highborn and the lowborn parting or lifting and standing or squatting, there's not much left to be embarrassed about. Is there, Anjin San? No. Good, she had said, very satisfied. Soon you will like raw fish and fresh seaweed, and then you'll really be Hatamoto. The maid poured water over her. Then, cleansed, Mariko stepped into the bath and lay down opposite him with a long drawn sigh of ecstasy, the little crucifix dangling between her breasts. How do you do that? he said. What? Get in so quickly. It's so hot. I don't know, Anjin san, but I asked them to put more firewood on and to heat up the water. For you, Fujiko always makes sure it's we would call it tepid. If this is tepid, then I'm a Dutchman's uncle. What? Nothing. The water's heat made them drowsy and they lolled a while, not saying a word. Later she said, What would you like to do this evening, Anjin san? If we were up in London we'd... Blackthorn stopped. I won't think about them, he told himself. Or London. That's gone. That doesn't exist. Only here exists. If... She was watching him, aware of the change. We go to a theater and see a play, he said, dominating himself. Do you have plays here? Oh, yes, Anjin san. Plays are very popular with us. The Taiko liked to perform in them for the entertainment of his guests, even Lord Toranaga likes to. And of course there are many touring companies for the common people. But our plays are not quite like yours, so I believe. Here our actors and actresses wear masks. We call the plays no. They're part music, partially danced and mostly very sad, very tragic, historical plays. Some are comedies. Would we see a comedy? Or perhaps a religious play? No, we'd go to the Globe Theater and see something by a playwright called Shakespeare. I like him better than Ben Jonson or Marlowe. Perhaps we'd see The Taming of the Shrew or A Midsummer Night's Dream or Romeo and Juliet. I took my wife to Romeo and Juliet, and she liked it very much. He explained the plots to her. Mostly Mariko found them incomprehensible. It would be unthinkable here for a girl to disobey her father like that. But so sad, nay? Sad for a young girl and sad for the boy. She was only thirteen. Do all your ladies marry so young? No. Fifteen or sixteen's usual. My wife was seventeen when we were married. How old were you? Just fifteen, Anjin san. A shadow crossed her brow which he did not notice. And after the play... What would we do? I would take you to eat. We'd go to Stone's Chop House in Fetter Lane, or the Cheshire Cheese in Fleet Street. They are inns where the food's special. What would you eat? I'd rather not remember, he said with a lazy smile, turning his mind back to the present. I can't remember. Here is where we are and here is where we'll eat, and I enjoy raw fish and karma is karma. He sank deeper into the tub. A great word karma. And a great idea. Your help's been enormous to me, Mariko-san. It's my pleasure to be of a little service to you. Mariko relaxed into the warmth. Fujiko has some special food for you tonight. Oh? She bought a I think you call it a pheasant. It's a large bird. One of the falconers caught it for her. A pheasant? You really mean it? Hanto? Hanto, she replied. Fujiko asked them to hunt for you. She asked me to tell you. 
How is it being cooked? One of the soldiers had seen the Portuguese preparing them, and he told Fujiko-san. She asks you to be patient if it's not cooked properly. But how is she doing it? How are the cooks doing it? He corrected himself, for servants alone did the cooking and cleaning. She was told that first someone pulls out all the feathers, then then takes out the entrails. Mariko controlled her squeamishness. Then the birds either cut into small pieces and fried with oil, or boiled with salt and spices. Her nose wrinkled. Sometimes they cover it with mud and put it into the coals of a fire and bake it. We have no ovens, Anjin-san. So it will be fried. I hope that's all right. I'm sure it'll be perfect. He said, certain it would be inedible. She laughed. You're so transparent, Anjin-san, sometimes. You don't understand how important food is. In spite of himself, he smiled. You're right. I shouldn't be interested in food. But I can't control hunger. You'll soon be able to do that. You'll even learn how to drink cha from an empty cup. What? This is not the place to explain that, Anjin-san, or the time. For that you must be very awake and very alert. A quiet sunset, or dawning, is necessary. I will show you how, one day, because of what you did. Oh, it is so good to lie here, isn't it? A bath is truly the gift of God. He heard the servants outside the wall, stoking the fire. He bore the intensifying heat as long as he could, then emerged from the water, half helped by Suo, and lay back gasping on the thick towel cloth. The old man's fingers probed. Blackthorn could have cried out with pleasure. That's so good. You've changed so much in the last few days, Anjin-san. Have I? Oh yes, since your rebirth, yes, very much. He tried to recall the first night but could remember little. Somehow he had made it back on his own legs. Fujiko and the servants had helped him to bed. After a dreamless sleep, he woke at dawn and went for a swim. Then, drying in the sun, he had thanked God for the strength and the clue that Mariko had given him. Later, walking home, he greeted the villagers, knowing secretly that they were freed of Yabu's curse, as he was freed. Then, when Mariko had arrived, he had sent for Mura. Mariko-san, please tell Mura this. We have a problem, you and I. We will solve it together. I want to join the village school. To learn to speak with children. They haven't a school, Anjin-san. None? No. Mura says there's a monastery a few read to the west, and the monks could teach you reading and writing if you wish. But this is a village, Anjin-san. The children here need to learn the ways of fish, the sea, making nets planting and growing rice and crops. There's little time for anything else, except reading and writing. And two, parents and grandparents teach their own, as always. Then how can I learn when you've gone? Lord Toronaga will send the books. I'll need more than books. Everything will be satisfactory, Anjin-san. Yes. Perhaps. But tell the headman that whenever I make a mistake, everyone everyone, even a child is to correct me. At once. I order it. He says thank you, Anjin-san. Does anyone here speak Portuguese? He says no. Anyone nearby? I, Anjin-san. Mariko-san, I've got to have someone when you leave. I'll tell Yabu-san what you've said. Mura-san, you, he says you must not use San to him or to any villagers. They are beneath you. It's not correct for you to say sand to them or anyone beneath you. Fujiko had also bowed to the ground that first day. Fujiko-san welcomes you home, and Jinsen. She says you have done her great honor, and she begs your forgiveness for being rude on the ship. She is honored to be consort and head of your house. She asks if you will keep the swords as it would please her greatly. They belong to her father, who is dead. She had not given them to her husband because he had swords of his own. Thank her and say I'm honored she's consort. He had said. Mariko had bowed too. Formally. You are in a new life now, Anjin-san. We look at you with new eyes. It is our custom to be formal sometimes, with great seriousness. 
You have opened my eyes. Very much. Once you were just a barbarian to me. Please excuse my stupidity. What you did proves your samurai. Now you are samurai. Please forgive my previous bad manners. He had felt very tall that day. But his self-inflicted near death had changed him more than he realized and scarred him forever, more than the sum of all his other near deaths. Did you rely on Omi? He asked himself. That Omi would catch the blow? Didn't you give him plenty of warning? I don't know. I only know I'm glad he was ready, Blackthorn answered himself truthfully. That's another life gone. That's my ninth life. The last, he said aloud. Soa's fingers ceased at once. What? Mariko asked. What did you say, Anjin san? Nothing. It was nothing, he replied ill at ease. I hurt you, master, Soa said. No. Suwo said something more that he did not understand. Dozo? Mariko said distantly. He wants to massage your back now. Blackthorn turned on his stomach and repeated the Japanese and forgot it at once. He could see her through the steam. She was breathing deeply, her head tilted back slightly, her skin pink. How does she stand the heat? He asked himself. Training, I suppose, from childhood. Suwo's fingers pleasured him, and he drowsed momentarily. What was I thinking about? You were thinking about your ninth life, your last life, and you were frightened, remembering the superstition. But it is foolish here in this land of the gods to be superstitious. Things are different here, and this is forever. Today is forever. Tomorrow many things can happen. Today I'll abide by their rules. I will. The maid brought in the covered dish. She held it high above her head as was custom, so that her breath would not defile the food. Anxiously she knelt and placed it carefully on the tray table in front of Blackthorn. On each little table were bowls and chopsticks, sake cups and napkins, and a tiny flower arrangement. Fujiko and Mariko were sitting opposite him. They wore flowers and silver combs in their hair. Fujiko's kimono was a pale green pattern of fish on a white background, her obi gold. Mariko wore black and red with a thin silver overlay of chrysanthemums and a red and silver check obi. Both wore perfume, as always. Incense burned to keep the night bugs away. Blackthorn had long since composed himself. He knew that any displeasure from him would destroy their evening. If pheasants could be caught there would be other game, he thought. He had a horse and guns and he could hunt himself, if only he could get the time. Fujiko leaned over and took the lid off the dish. The small pieces of fried meat were browned and seemed perfect. He began to salivate at the aroma. Slowly he took a piece of meat in his chopsticks, willing it not to fall, and chewed the flesh. It was tough and dry, but he had been meatless for so long it was delicious. Another piece. He sighed with pleasure. Ichiban, Ichiban, by God! Fujiko blushed and poured him sake to hide her face. Mariko fanned herself, the crimson fan a dragonfly. Blackthorn quaffed the wine and ate another piece and poured more wine and ritualistically offered his brimming cup to Fujiko. She refused, as was custom, but tonight he insisted, so she drained the cup, choking slightly. Mariko also refused and was also made to drink. Then he attacked the pheasant with as little gusto as he could manage. The women hardly touched their small portions of vegetables and fish. This didn't bother him because it was a female custom to eat before or afterwards so that all their attention could be devoted to the master. He ate all the pheasant and three bowls of rice and slurped his sake, which was also good manners. He felt replete for the first time in months. During the meal he had finished six flasks of the hot wine, Mariko and Fujiko too between them. Now they were flushed and giggling and at the silly stage. Mariko chuckled and put her hand in front of her mouth. I wish I could drink sake like you, Anjin-san. You drink sake better than any man I've ever known. I wager you'd be the best in Aizu. I could win a lot of money on you. I thought samurai disapproved of gambling. 
Oh, they do. Absolutely they do. They're not merchants and peasants. But not all samurai are as strong as others and many how do you say many will bet like the southern bar like the Portuguese bet? Do women bet? Oh, yes. Very much. But only with other ladies and in careful amounts and always so their husbands never find out. She gaily translated for Fujiko, who was more flushed than she. Your consort asks do Englishmen bet? Do you like to wager? It's our national pastime. And he told them about horse racing and skittles and bull baiting and coursing and whippets and hawking and bowls and the new stock companies and letters of mark and shooting and darts and lotteries and boxing and cards and wrestling and dice and checkers and dominoes and the time at the fairs. When you put farthings on numbers and bet against the wheels of chance. But how do you find time to live, to war, and to pillow, Fujiko asks? There's always time for those. Their eyes met for a moment, but he could not read anything in hers, only happiness and maybe too much wine. Mariko begged him to sing the hornpipe song for Fujiko, and he did and they congratulated him and said it was the best they had ever heard. Have some more sake. Oh, you mustn't pour, Anjin-san, that's woman's duty. Didn't I tell you? Yes. Have some more, Dozo. I'd better not. I think I'll fall over. Mariko fluttered her fan furiously, and the draft stirred the threads of hair that had escaped from her immaculate coiffure. You have nice ears, he said. So have you. We, Fujiko-san and I, we think your nose is perfect too, worthy of a daimyo. He grinned and bowed elaborately to them. They bowed back. The folds of Mariko's kimono fell away from her neck slightly, revealing the edge of her scarlet under kimono and the swell of her breasts, and it stirred him considerably. Sake, Anjin-san? He held out the cup, his fingers steady. She poured, watching the cup, the tip of her tongue touching her lips as she concentrated. Fujiko reluctantly accepted some too, though she said that she couldn't feel her legs anymore. Her quiet melancholia had gone tonight, and she seemed young again. Blackthorn noticed that she was not as ugly as he had once thought. Josen's head was buzzing. Not from sake, but from the incredible war strategy that Yabu, Omi, and Igarashi had described so openly. Only Naga, the second in command, son of the archenemy, had said nothing, and had remained throughout the evening cold, arrogant, stiff-backed, with the characteristic large Toranaga nose on a taut face. Astonishing, Yabusama, Josen said. Now I can understand the reason for secrecy. My master will understand it also. Wise, very wise. And you, Nagasan, you've been silent all evening. I'd like your opinion. How do you like this new mobility, this new strategy? My father believes that all war possibilities should be considered, Josen san The young man replied. But you, what's your opinion? I was sent here only to obey, to observe, to listen, to learn, and to test. Not to give opinions. Of course. But as second in command, I should say, as an illustrious second in command, do you consider the experiment a success? Yabusama or Omisan should answer that or my father. But Yabusama said that everyone tonight was to talk freely. What's there to hide? We are all friends, nay? So famous a son of so famous a father must have an opinion. Nay? Naga's eyes narrowed under the taunt, but he did not reply. Everyone can speak freely, Nagasan. Yabu said. What do you think? I think that, with surprise, this idea would win one skirmish or possibly one battle. With surprise, yes. But then? Naga's voice swept on icily. Then all sides would use the same plan and vast numbers of men would die unnecessarily, slain without honor by an assailant who won't even know who he has killed. I doubt if my father will actually authorize its use in a real battle. He said that? Yabu put the question incisively, careless of Josen. No, Yabusama. I'm giving my own opinion. Of course. But the musket regiment you don't approve of it? It disgusts you? Yabu asked darkly. 
Naga looked at him with flat, reptilian eyes. With great deference, since you asked my opinion, yes, I find it disgusting. Our forefathers have always known whom they killed or who defeated them. That's Bushido, our way, the way of the warrior, the way of a true samurai. The better man victorious, nay? But now this? How do you prove your valor to your lord? How can he reward courage? To charge bullets is brave, yes, but also stupid. Where's the valor in that? Guns are against our samurai code. Barbarians fight this way, peasants fight this way. Do you realize filthy merchants and peasants, even ETA, could fight this way? Josen laughed and Naga continued even more menacingly. A few fanatic peasants could easily kill any number of samurai with enough guns. Yes, peasants could kill any one of us, even the Lord Ishido, who wants to sit in my father's place. Josen bridled. Lord Ishido doesn't covet your father's lands. He only seeks to protect the empire for its rightful heir. My father's no threat to the Lord Yemen, or to the realm. Of course, but you were talking about peasants. The Lord Tycho was once a peasant. My Lord Ishido was once a peasant. I was once a peasant. And a ronin. Naga wanted no quarrel. He knew he was no match for Josen, whose prowess was sword and axe was renowned. I wasn't trying to insult your master or you or anyone, Josen san. I was merely saying that we samurai must all make very certain that peasants never have guns or none of us will be safe. Merchants and peasants will never worry us, Josen said. I agree, Yabu added, and Nagasan, I agree with part of what you say. Yes, but guns are modern. Soon all battles will be fought with guns. I agree it's distasteful, but it's the way of modern war. And then it'll be as it always was the bravest samurai will always conquer. No, so sorry, but you're wrong, Yabusama. What did this cursed barbarian tell us the essence of their war strategy? He freely admits that all their armies are conscript and mercenary. Nay, mercenary. No sense of duty to their lords. The soldiers only fight for pay and loot, to rape and to gorge. Didn't he say their armies are peasant armies? That's what guns have brought to their world and that's what guns will bring to ours. If I had power, I'd take this barbarian's head tonight and outlaw all guns permanently. Is that what your father thinks? Josen asked too quickly. My father doesn't tell me or anyone what he thinks, as you surely know. I don't speak for my father, no one speaks for him. Naga replied, angry at allowing himself to be trapped into talking at all. I was sent here to obey, to listen and not to talk. I apologize for talking. I would not have spoken unless you asked me. If I have offended you, or you, Yabusama, or you, Omi-san, I apologize. There's no need to apologize. I asked your views, Yabu said. Why should anyone be offended? This is a discussion, nay? Among leaders. You'd outlaw guns? Yes. I think you'd be wise to keep a very close check on every gun in your domain. All peasants are forbidden weapons of any kind. My peasants and my people are very well controlled. Josen smirked at the slim youth, loathing him. Interesting ideas you have, Nagasan. But you're mistaken about the peasants. They're nothing to samurai but providers. They're no more threat than a pile of dumb. At the moment, Naga said, his pride commanding him. That's why I'd outlaw guns now. You're right, Yabusan, that a new era requires new methods. But because of what this Anjinsen, this one barbarian, has said I'd go much further than our present laws. I would issue edicts that anyone other than a samurai found with a gun or caught trading in guns would immediately forfeit his life and that of every member of his family of every generation. Further, I would prohibit the making or importing of guns. I'd prohibit barbarians from wearing them or from bringing them to our shores. Yes, if I had power which I do not seek and never will I de keep barbarians out of our country totally, except for a few priests and one port for trade. 
which I'd surround with a high fence and trusted warriors. Last, I'd put this foul-minded barbarian, the Anjinsan, to death at once so that his filthy knowledge will not spread. He's a disease. Josen said, Ah, Nagasan, it must be good to be so young. You know, my master agrees with much of what you said about the barbarians. I've heard him say many times, Keep them out, kick them out, kick their arses away to Nagasaki, and keep them bottled there. You'd kill the Anjinsan, eh? Interesting. My master doesn't like the Anjinsan either. But for him. He stopped. Ah, yes, you've a good thought about guns. I can see that clearly. May I tell that to my master? Your idea about new laws? Of course. Naga was mollified, and calmer now that he had spoken what had been bottled up from the first day. You've given this opinion to Lord Toronaga? Yabu asked. Lord Toronaga has not asked my opinion. I hope one day he will honor me by asking as you have done. Naga replied at once with sincerity, and wondered if any of them detected the lie. Omi said, As this is a free discussion, sire, I say this barbarian is a treasure. I believe we must learn from the barbarian. We must know about guns and fighting ships because they know about them. We must know everything they know as soon as they know it, and even now, some of us must begin to learn to think like they do so that soon we can surpass them. Naga said confidently. What could they possibly know, Omi-san? Yes, guns and ships. But what else? How could they destroy us? There's not a samurai among them. Doesn't this Anjin admit openly that even their kings are murderers and religious fanatics? We're millions, they're a handful. We could swamp them with our hands alone. This Anjin-san opened my eyes, Naga-san. I've discovered that our land... And China isn't the whole world, it's only a very small part. At first I thought the barbarian was just a curiosity. Now I don't. I thank the gods for him. I think he saved us and I know we can learn from him. Already he's given us power over the southern barbarians and over China. What? The Tycho failed because their numbers are too great for us, man to man, arrow to arrow, nay? With guns and barbarian skill we could take Peking. With barbarian treachery, Omi-san. With barbarian knowledge, Naga-san, we could take Peking. Whoever takes Peking eventually controls China. And whoever controls China can control the world. We must learn not to be ashamed of taking knowledge from wherever it comes. I say we need nothing from outside. Without offense, Naga-san... I say we must protect this land of the gods by any means. It's our prime duty to protect the unique, divine position we have on earth. Only this is the land of the gods, nay? Only our emperor is divine. I agree this barbarian should be gagged. But not by death. By permanent isolation here in Anjiro, until we have learned everything he knows. Josen scratched thoughtfully. My master will be told of your views. I agree the barbarian should be isolated. Also that training should cease at once. Yabu took a scroll from his sleeve. Here is a full report on the experiment for Lord Ishido. When Lord Ishido wishes the training to cease, of course, the training will cease. Josen accepted the scroll. And Lord Toranaga? What about him? His eyes went to Naga. Naga said nothing but stared at the scroll. Yabu said, You will be able to ask his opinion directly. He has a similar report. I presume you'll be leaving for Yido tomorrow? Or would you like to witness the training? I hardly need tell you the men are not yet proficient. I would like to see one attack. Omi-san, arrange it. You lead it. Yes, sire. Josen turned to his second-in-command and gave him the scroll. Masamoto, Take this to Lord Ishido. You will leave at once. Yes, Josen san Yabu said to Igarashi. Provide him with guides to the border and fresh horses. Igarashi left with the samurai immediately. Josen stretched and yawned. Please excuse me, he said, but it's all the riding I've done in the last few days. 
I must thank you for an extraordinary evening, Yabusama. Your ideas are far-reaching. And yours, Omi-san. And yours, Naga-san. I'll compliment you to the Lord Toranaga and to my master. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm very tired and Osaka is a long way off. Of course, Yabu said. How was Osaka? Very good. Remember those bandits, the ones that attacked you by land and sea? Of course. We took 450 heads that night. Many were wearing Toranaga uniforms. Ronin have no honor. None. Some Ronin have, Josen said, smarting from the insult. He lived always with the shame of having once been Ronin. Some were even wearing our greys. Not one escaped. They all died. And Buntaro-san? No. He, Josen stopped. The no had slipped out but now that he had said it he did not mind. No. We don't know for certain no one collected his head. You've heard nothing about him? No, Naga said. Perhaps he was captured. Perhaps they just cut him into pieces and scattered him. My master would like to know when you have news. All's very good now at Osaka. Preparations for the meeting go forward. There'll be lavish entertainments to celebrate the new era, and of course, to honor all the daimyos. And Lord Toda Hiromatsu? Naga asked politely. Old iron fists as strong and gruff as ever. He's still there? No. He left with all your father's men a few days before I did. And my father's household? I heard that the Lady Karitsubo and the Lady Suzuko asked to stay with my master. A doctor advised the lady to rest for a month her health, you know. He thought the journey would not be good for the expected child. To Yabu he added, She fell down the night you left, didn't she? Yes. There's nothing serious, I hope. Naga asked, very concerned. No, Naga-san, nothing serious, Josen said then again to Yabu. You've informed Lord Toranaga of my arrival? Of course. Good. The news you brought us would interest him greatly. Yes. I saw a carrier pigeon circle and fly north. I have that service now. Yabu did not add that Josen's pigeon had also been observed, or that falcons had intercepted it near the mountains, or that the message had been decoded. At Anjiro. All true as reported. Yabu, Naga, Omi, and Barbarian here. I will leave tomorrow, with your permission, after the attack. You'll give me fresh horses? I must not keep Lord Toranaga waiting. I look forward to seeing him. So does my master. At Osaka. I hope you'll accompany him, Naga-san. If I'm ordered there, I will be there. Naga kept his eyes lowered but he was burning with suppressed fury. Josen left and walked with his guards up the hill to his camp. He rearranged the sentries and ordered his men to sleep and got into his small brush lean-to that they had constructed against the coming rain. By candlelight, under a mosquito net, he rewrote the previous message on a thin piece of rice paper and added, The 500 guns are lethal. Mass surprise gun attacks plan full report already sent with Masamoto. Then he dated it and doused the candle. In the darkness he slipped out of his net removed one of the pigeons from the panniers and placed the message in the tiny container on its foot. Then he stealthily made his way to one of his men and handed him the bird. Take it out into the brush, he whispered. Hide it somewhere where it can roost safely until dawn, as far away as you can. But be careful, there are eyes all around. If you're intercepted, say I told you to patrol, but hide the pigeon first. The man slid away as silently as a cockroach. Pleased with himself, Josen looked toward the village below. There were lights on in the fortress and on the opposite slope, in the house that he knew to be Omi's. There were a few also in the house just below, the one presently occupied by the barbarian. That whelp Naga's right, Josen thought, waving his hand at a mosquito. The barbarian's a filthy plague. Good night, Fujiko-san. Good night, Anjin-san. The shoji closed behind her.
Blackthorn took off his kimono and loincloth and put on the lighter sleeping kimono, got under the mosquito net, and lay down. He blew out the candle. Deep darkness enveloped him. The house was quiet now. The small shutters were closed, and he could hear the surf. Clouds obscured the moon. The wine and laughter had made him drowsy and euphoric and he listened to the surf and felt himself drifting with it, his mind fogged. Occasionally, a dog barked in the village below. I should get a dog, he thought, remembering his own bull terrier at home. Wonder if he's still alive? Grog was his name but Tudor, his son, always called him. O.G.O.G. Oh, oh, G. Ah, Tudor, laddie. It's been such a long time. Wish I could see you all even write a letter and send it home. Let's see, he thought. How would I begin? My darlings, this is the first letter I've been able to send home since we made landfall in Japan. Things are well now that I know how to live according to their ways. The food is terrible but tonight I had pheasant and soon I'll get my ship back again. Where to start my story? Today I'm like a feudal lord in this strange country. I have a house, a horse, eight servants, a housekeeper, my own barber, and my own interpreter. I'm clean-shaven now and shave every day the steel razors they have here must certainly be the best in the world. My salary is huge enough to feed 250 Japan families for one year. In England that'd be the equivalent of almost a thousand golden guineas a year. Ten times my salary from the Dutch company. The shoji began to open. His hand sought his pistol under the pillow and he readied, dragging himself back. Then he caught the almost imperceptible rustle of silk and a waft of perfume. Anjin-san? A thread of whisper, filled with promise. Hi, he asked us softly, peering into the darkness, unable to see clearly. Footsteps came closer. There was the sound of her kneeling, and the net was pulled aside and she joined him inside the enclosing net. She took his hand and lifted it to her breast, then to her lips. Mariko-san? At once fingers reached up in the darkness and touched his lips, cautioning silence. He nodded, understanding the awful risk they were taking. He held her tiny wrist and brushed it with his lips. In the pitch black his other hand sought and caressed her face. She kissed his fingers one by one. Her hair was loose and waist-length now. His hands traveled her. The lovely feel of silk, nothing beneath. Her taste was sweet. His tongue touched her teeth, then rimmed her ears, discovering her. She loosened his robe and let hers fall aside, her breathing more languorous now. She pushed closer, nestling, and pulled the covering over their heads. Then she began to love him, with hands and with lips with more tenderness and seeking and knowledge than he had ever known. Chapter 33 Blackthorn awoke at dawn. Alone. At first he was sure he had been dreaming, but her perfume still lingered and he knew that it had not been a dream. A discreet knock. Hi! Oheo, Anjin-san, Goman Nasai. A maid opened the shoji for Fujiko then carried in the tray with cha and a bowl of rice gruel and sweet rice cakes. Oheo, Fujiko-san domo, he said, thanking her. She always came with his first meal personally, opened the net, and waited while he ate, and the maid laid out a fresh kimono and tabi and loincloth. He sipped the cha, wondering if Fujiko knew about last night. Her face gave nothing away. Ikaga disuka? How are you? Blackthorn asked. Okagasama de Jenki Disu, Anjin san. Anada wa? Very well, thank you. And you? The maid took out his fresh clothes from the concealed cupboard that melted neatly into the rest of the paper lattice room, then left them alone. Anada wa yokunamutaka? Did you sleep well? Hi, Anjin san, Arigato Gozia Mashida. She smiled put her hand to her head pretending pain, mind being drunk and sleeping like a stone. Anada wa? Watashi wa yoku nimuru? I slept very well. She corrected him. Watashi wa yoku nimura. Domo. Watashi wa yoku nimura. 
You are. Tai Hen Ya. Good. Very good. Then from the corridor he heard Mariko call out. Fujiko-san? Hi, Mariko-san. Fujiko went to the shoji and opened it a crack. He could not see Mariko. And he did not understand what they were saying. I hope no one knows, he thought. I pray it is secret, just between us. Perhaps it would be better if it had been a dream. He began to dress. Fujiko came back and knelt to do up the catches on the tabi. Mariko-san? Nanja? Nane mo Anjin-san, she replied. It was nothing important. She went to the Takanama, the alcove with its hanging scroll and flower arrangement, where his swords were always put. She gave them to him. He stuck them in his belt. The swords no longer felt ridiculous to him, though he wished that he could wear them less self-consciously. She had told him that her father had been granted the swords for bravery after a particularly bloody battle in the far north of Korea, seven years ago during the first invasion. The Japanese armies had ripped through the kingdom, victorious, slashing north. Then, when they were near the Yalu River, the Chinese hordes had abruptly poured across the border to join battle with the Japanese armies and, through the weight of their incredible numbers, had routed them. Fujiko's father had been part of the rearguard that had covered the retreat back to the mountains north of Seoul, where they had turned and fought the battle to a stalemate. This, and the second campaign, had been the costliest military expedition ever undertaken. When the Taiko had died last year, Toronaga, on behalf of the Council of Regents, had at once ordered the remnants of their armies home, to the great relief of the vast majority of daimyos. Who detested the Korean campaign. Blackthorn walked out to the veranda. He stepped into his thongs and nodded to his servants, who had been assembled in a neat line to bow him off, as was custom. It was a drab day. The sky was overcast and a warm wet wind came off the sea. The stepping stones that were set into the gravel of the path were wet with the rain that had fallen in the night. Beyond the gate were the horses and his ten samurai outriders and Mariko. She was already mounted and wore a pale yellow mantle over pale green silk trousers, a wide-brimmed hat and veil held with yellow ribbons, and gloves. A rain parasol was ready in its saddle sheath. Oh hail, he said formally. Oh hail, Mariko-san. Oh hail, Anjin-san. Ikaga disu ka? Okujesama de jenki disa. Anada wa? She smiled. You are, Arigato Gozia Mishida. She gave not the faintest hint that anything was different between them. But he expected none, not in public, knowing how dangerous the situation was. Her perfume came over him and he would have liked to kiss her here, in front of everyone. Ikimasho, he said and swung into the saddle, motioning the samurai to ride off ahead. He walked his horse leisurely and Mariko fell into place beside him. When they were alone, he relaxed. Mariko. Hi. Then he said in Latin. Thou art beautiful and I love thee. I thank thee, but so much wine last night makes my head to feel not beautiful today, not in truth, and love is a Christian word. Thou art beautiful and Christian, and wine could not touch thee. Thank thee for the lie, Unjin San, yes, thank thee. No. I should thank thee. Oh? Why? Never why and no why. I thank thee sincerely. If wine and meat make thee so warm and fine and gallant, she said, then I must tell thy consort to move the heaven and the earth to obtain them for thee every evening. Yes. I would have everything the same, always. Thou art untoward happy today, she said. Good, very good. But why? Why truly? Because of thee. Thou knowest why. I know nothing, Anjin-san. Nothing? He teased. Nothing. He was taken aback. They were quite alone and safe. Why doth nothing take the heart out of thy smile? She asked. Stupidity. Absolute stupidity. I forgot that it is most wise to be cautious. 
It was only that we were alone and I wanted to speak of it. And in truth, to say more, thou speakest in riddles. I do not understand thee. He was not plussed again. Thou dost not wish to talk about it. At all? About what, Anjin San? What passed in the night then? I passed thy door in the night when my maid Koi was with thee. What? We, your consort, and I, we thought she would be a pleasing gift for thee. She pleased thee, did she not? Blackthorn was trying to recover. Mariko's maid was her size but younger and never so fair and never so pretty. And yes, it was pitch dark and yes, his head was fogged with wine but no, it was not the maid. That's not possible, he said in Portuguese. What's not possible, senor? She asked in the same language. He reverted to Latin again, as the outriders were not far away, the wind blowing in their direction. Please do not joke with me. No one can hear. I know a presence and a perfume. Thou thinkest it was me? Oh, it was not, Anjin San. I would be honored, but I could never possibly. However much I might want, oh no, Anjin San. It was not me but Koi, my maid. I would be honored, but I belong to another even though he's dead. Yes, but it wasn't your maid. He bit back his anger. But leave it as thou desirest. It was my maid, Anjin San. She said placatingly. We anointed her with my perfume and instructed her. No words, only touch. We never thought for a moment thou wouldst consider her to be me. This was not to trick thee but for thine ease, knowing that discussing things of the pillow still embarrasses thee. She was looking at him with wide, innocent eyes. She pleasured thee, Anjin San? Thou pleasured her. A joke concerning things of great importance is sometimes without humor. Things of great import will always be treated with great import. But a maid in the night with a man is without import. I do not consider thee without import. I thank thee. I say that equally. But a maid in the night with a man is private and without import. It is a gift from her to him and sometimes from him to her. Nothing more. Never? Sometimes. But this private pillow matter does not have this vast seriousness of thine. Never? Only when the woman and man join together against the law. In this land. He reined in, finally comprehending the reason for her denial. I apologize, he said. Yes, thou art right and I most very wrong. I should never have spoken. I apologize. Why apologize? For what? Tell me, Anjin San, was this girl wearing a crucifix? No. I always wear it. Always. A crucifix can be taken off he said automatically in Portuguese. That proves nothing. It could be loaned like a perfume. Tell me a last truth. Did you really see the girl? Really see her? Of course. Please let us forget I ever. The night was very dark, the moon overcast. Please, the truth, Anjin San. Think. Did you really see the girl? Of course I saw her, he thought indignantly. God damn it, think truly. You didn't see her. Your head was fogged. She could have been the maid, but you knew it was Mariko because you wanted Mariko and saw only Mariko in your head, believing that Mariko would want you equally. You're a fool. A goddamn fool. In truth, no. In truth, I should really apologize, he said. How do I apologize? There's no need to apologize, Anjin San. She replied calmly. I've told you many times a man never apologizes, even when he's wrong. You were not wrong. Her eyes teased him now. My maid needs no apology. Thank you, he said, laughing. You make me feel less of a fool. The years flee from you when you laugh. The so serious Anjin San becomes a boy again. My father told me I was born old. Were you? He thought so. What's he like? He was a fine man. A shipowner, a captain. The Spanish killed him at a place called Antwerp when they put that city to the sword. They burned his ship. I was six, but I remember him as a big, tall, 
good-natured man with golden hair. My older brother Arthur, he was just eight we had bad times then, Mariko-san. Why? Please tell me. Please. It's all very ordinary. Every penny of money was tied into the ship and that was lost. And well, not long after that, my sister died. She starved to death, really. There was famine in 71 and plague again. We have plague sometimes. The smallpox. You were many in your family? Three of us. He said, glad to talk to take away the other hurt. Willia, my sister, she was nine when she died. Arthur, he was next he wanted to be an artist, a sculptor, but he had to become an apprentice stonemason to help support us. He was killed in the armada. He was twenty-five, poor fool, he just joined a ship, untrained, such a waste. I'm the last of the Blackthorns. Arthur's wife and daughter live with my wife and kids now. My mother's still alive and so's old Granny Yakoba she's seventy-five and hard as a piece of English oak though she was Irish. At least they were alive when I left more than two years ago. The ache was coming back. I'll think about them when I start for home, he promised himself, but not until then. There'll be a storm tomorrow, he said, watching the sea. A strong one, Mariko-san. Then in three days we'll have fair weather. This is the season of squalls. Mostly it's overcast and rain-filled. When the rains stop it becomes very humid. Then begin the typhoons. I wish I were at sea again, he was thinking. Was I ever at sea? Was the ship real? What's reality? Mariko or the maid? You don't laugh very much, do you, Anjin-san? I've been seafaring too long. Seamanry always serious. We've learned to watch the sea. We're always watching and waiting for disaster. Take your eyes off the sea for a second and she'll grasp your ship and make her matchwood. I'm afraid of the sea, she said. So am I. An old fisherman told me once, the man who's not afraid of the seal soon be drowned dead for he'll go out on a day he shouldn't. But we'd be afraid of the sea so we'd be only drowned dead now and again. He looked at her. Mariko-san. Yes? A few minutes ago you convinced me that well, let's say I was convinced. Now I'm not. What's the truth? The Hanto. I must know. Ears are to hear with. Of course it was the maid. This maid. Can I ask for her whenever I want? Of course. A wise man would not. Because I might be disappointed? Next time? Possibly. I find it difficult to possess a maid and lose a maid, difficult to say nothing. Pillowing is a pleasure. Of the body. Nothing has to be said. But how do I tell a maid that she is beautiful? That I love her? That she filled me with ecstasy? It isn't seemly to love a maid this way. Not here, Anjin-san. That passion's not even for a wife or a consort. Her eyes crinkled suddenly but only towards someone like Kiku-san, the courtesan, who is so beautiful and merits this. Where can I find this girl? In the village. It would be my honor to act as your go-between. By Christ, I think you mean it. Of course. A man needs passions of all kinds. This lady is worthy of romance if you can afford her. What does that mean? She would be very expensive. You don't buy love. That type's worth nothing. Love is without price. She smiled. Pillowing always has its price. Always. Not necessarily money, Anjin-san. But a man pays, always, for pillowing in one way or in another. True love, we call it duty, is of soul to soul and needs no such expression, no physical expression, except perhaps the gift of death. You're wrong. I wish I could show you the world as it is. I know the world as it is, and as it will be forever. You want this contemptible maid again? Yes. You know I want. Mariko laughed gaily. Then she will be sent to you. At sunset. We will escort her, Fujiko and I. God damn it, I think you would too. He laughed with her. Ah, uh, Anjin-san, it is good to see you laugh. 
Since you came back to Angiro you have gone through a great change. A very great change. No. Not so much. But last night I dreamed a dream. That dream was perfection. God is perfection. And sometimes so is a sunset or moonrise or the first crocus of the year. I don't understand you at all. She turned back the veil on her hat and looked directly at him. Once another man said to me, I don't understand you at all, and my husband said, Your pardon, Lord, but no man can understand her. Her father doesn't understand her, either do the gods, nor her barbarian god, not even her mother understands her. That was Torinaga? Lord Torinaga? Oh, no, Anjin-san. That was the Taiko. Lord Torinaga understands me. He understands everything. Even me? Very much you. You're sure of that, aren't you? Yes. Oh, very yes. Will he win the war? Yes. I'm his favorite vassal? Yes. Will he take my navy? Yes. When will I get my ship back? You won't. Why? Her gravity vanished. Because you'll have your maid in Angiro and you'll be pillowing so much you'll have no energy to leave, even on your hands and knees, when she begs you to go aboard your ship, and when Lord Toronaga asks you to go aboard and to leave us all. There you go again. One moment so serious, the next not. That's only to answer you, Anjin-san, and to put certain things in a correct place. Ah, uh, but before you leave us you should see the Lady Kiku. She's worthy of a great passion. She's so beautiful and talented. For her you would have to be extraordinary. I'm tempted to accept that challenge. I challenge no one. But if you're prepared to be samurai and not not foreigner, if you're prepared to treat pillowing for what it is, then I would be honored to act as go-between. What does that mean? When you're in good humor, when you're ready for very special amusement, ask your consort to ask me. Why Fujiko-san? Because it's your consort's duty to see that you are pleasured. It is our custom to make life simple. We admire simplicity, so men and women can take pillowing for what it is, an important part of life, certainly, but between a man and a woman there are more vital things. Humility for one. Respect. Duty. Even this love of yours. Fujiko loves you. No, she doesn't. She will give you her life. What more is there to give? At length he took his eyes off her and looked at the sea. The waves were cresting the shore as the wind freshened. He turned back to her. Then nothing is to be said? He asked. Between us? Nothing. That is wise. And if I don't agree? You must agree. You are here. This is your home. The attacking five hundred galloped over the lip of the hill in a haphazard pack, down onto the rock-strewn valley floor where the two thousand, defenders, were drawn up in a battle array. Each rider wore a musket slung on his back and a belt with pouches for bullets, flints, and a powder horn. Like most samurai, their clothes were a motley collection of kimonos and rags, but their weapons always the best that each could afford. Only Torunaga and Ishido, copying him, insisted that their troops be uniformed and punctilious in their dress. All other daimyos considered such outward extravagance a foolish squandering of money and unnecessary. Innovation. Even Blackthorne had agreed. The armies of Europe were never uniformed what king could afford that, except for a personal guard. He was standing on a rise with Yabu and his aides, Josen and all his men, and Mariko. This was the first full-scale rehearsal of an attack. He waited uneasily. Yabu was uncommonly tense, and Omi and Naga both had been touchy almost to the point of belligerence. Particularly Naga. What's the matter with everyone? He had asked Mariko. Perhaps they wish to do well in front of their lord and his guests. Is he a daimyo too? No. But important, one of Lord Ishido's generals. It would be good if everything were perfect today. I wish I'd been told there was to be a rehearsal. What would that have accomplished? Everything you could do you have done. 
Yes, Blackthorn thought, as he watched the five hundred. But they're nowhere near ready yet. Surely Yabu knows that too, everyone does. So if there is a disaster, well, that's karma, he told himself with more confidence, and found consolation in that thought. The attackers gathered speed and the defenders stood waiting under the banners of their captains, jeering at the enemy, as they would normally do, strung out in loose formation, three or four men deep. Soon the attackers would dismount out of arrow range. Then the most valiant warriors on both sides would truculently strut to the fore to throw down the gauntlet, proclaiming their own lineage and superiority with the most obvious of insults. Single armed conflicts would begin, gradually increasing in numbers, until one commander would order a general attack and then it was every man for himself. Usually the greater number defeated the smaller, then the reserves would be brought up and committed, and again the melee until the morale of one side broke and the few cowards that retreated would soon be joined by the many and a rout would ensue. Treachery was not unusual. Sometimes whole regiments, following their master's orders, would switch sides, to be welcomed as allies always welcome but never trusted. Sometimes the defeated commanders would flee to regroup to fight again. Sometimes they would stay and fight to the death, sometimes they would commit seppuku with ceremony. Rarely were they captured. Some offered their services to the victors. Sometimes this was accepted but most times refused. Death was the lot of the vanquished, quick for the brave and shame-filled for the cowardly. And this was the historic pattern of all skirmishes in this land, even at great battles, soldiers here the same as everywhere, except that here they were more ferocious and many, many more were prepared to die for their masters than anywhere else on earth. The thunder of the hoofs echoed in the valley. Where's the attack, commander? Where's Omi-san? Josen asked. Among the men, be patient, Yabu replied. But where's his standard? And why isn't he wearing battle armor and plumes? Where's the commander's standard? They're just like a bunch of filthy no-good bandits. Be patient. All officers are ordered to remain nondescript. I told you. And please don't forget we're pretending a battle is raging, that this is part of a big battle, with reserves and arm. Josen burst out. Where are their swords? None of them are wearing swords. Samurai without swords? They'd be massacred. Be patient. Now the attackers were dismounting. The first warriors strode out from the defending ranks to show their valor. An equal number began to measure up against them. Then, suddenly, the Ungainly mass of attackers rushed into five tight disciplined phalanxes, each with four ranks of twenty-five men, three phalanxes ahead and two in reserve, forty paces back. As one, they charged the enemy. In range they shuddered to a stop on command and the front ranks fired an ear-shattering salvo in unison. Screams and men dying. Josen and his men ducked reflexively then watched appalled as the front ranks knelt and began to reload and the second ranks fired over them, with the third and fourth ranks following the same pattern. At each salvo more defenders fell, and the valley was filled with shouts and screams and confusion. You're killing your own men! Josen shouted above the uproar. It's blank ammunition, not real! They're all acting, but imagine it's a real attack with real bullets. Watch! Now the defenders, recovered, from the initial shock. They regrouped and whirled back to a frontal attack. But by this time the front ranks had reloaded and, on command, fired another salvo from a kneeling position, then the second rank fired standing, immediately kneeling to reload, then the third and the fourth, as before, and though many musketeers were slow and the ranks ragged. It was easy to imagine the awful decimation trained men would cause. The counterattack faltered, then broke apart, and the defenders retreated in pretended confusion, back up the rise to stop just below the observers. Many dead littered the ground. Josen and his men were shaken. Those guns would break any line. Wait. The battle's not over. Again the defenders reformed and now their commanders exhorted them to victory, committed the reserves, 
and ordered the final general attack. The samurai rushed down the hill, emitting their terrible battle cries, to fall on the enemy. Now they'll be stamped into the ground, Josen said, caught up like all of them in the realism of this mock battle. And he was right. The phalanxes did not hold their ground. They broke and fled before the battle cries of the true samurai with their swords and spears, and Josen and his men added their shouts of scorn as the regiments hurtled to the kill. The musketeers were fleeing like the garlic eaters, a hundred paces, two hundred paces, three hundred, then suddenly, on command, the phalanxes regrouped, this time in A.V. formation. Again the shattering salvos began. The attack faltered, then stopped. But the guns continued. Then they, too, stopped. The game ceased. But all on the rise knew that under actual conditions the two thousand would have been slaughtered. Now, in the silence, defenders and attackers began to sort themselves out. The bodies got up, weapons were collected. There was laughter and groaning. Many men limped, and a few were badly hurt. I congratulate you, Yabusama, Josen said with great sincerity. Now I understand what all of you meant. The firing was ragged, Yabu said, inwardly delighted. It will take months to train them. Josen shook his head. I wouldn't like to attack them now. Not if they had real ammunition. No army could withstand that punch no line. The ranks could never stay closed. And then you'd pour ordinary troops and cavalry through the gap and roll up the sides like an old scroll. He thanked all Kami that he'd had the sense to see one attack. It was terrible to watch. For a moment I thought the battle was real. They were ordered to make it look real. And now you may review my musketeers if you wish. Thank you. That would be an honor. The defenders were streaming off to their camps that sat on the far hillside. The five hundred musketeers waited below, near the path that went over the rise and slid down to the village. They were forming into their companies, Omi and Naga in front of them, both wearing swords again. Yabusama? Yes, Anjid san Good, no? Yes, good. Thank you, Yabusama. I please. Mariko corrected him automatically. I am pleased. Ah, so sorry. I am pleased. Josen took Yabu aside. This is all out of the Anjin san's head? No. Yabu lied. But it's the way barbarians fight. He's just training the men to load and to fire. Why not do as Nagasan advised? You've the barbarian's knowledge now. Why risk it spreading? He is a plague. Very dangerous, Yabusama. Nagasan was right. It's true peasants could fight this way. Easily. Get rid of the barbarian now. If Lord Ishido wants his head, he has only to ask. I ask it. Now. Again the truculence. I speak with his voice. I'll consider it, Josen san. And also, in his name, I ask that all guns be withdrawn from those troops at once. Yabu frowned, then turned his attention to the companies. They were approaching up the hill, their straight, disciplined ranks faintly ludicrous as always only because such order was unusual. Fifty paces away they halted. Omi and Naga came on alone and saluted. It was all right for a first exercise, Yabu said. Thank you, sire, Omi replied. He was limping slightly and his face was dirty, bruised, and powder-marked. Josen said, Your troops would have to carry swords in a real battle, Jabusama, nay? A samurai must carry swords eventually they'd run out of ammunition, nay? Eh? Swords will be in their way, in charge and retreat. Oh, they'll wear them as usual to maintain surprise, but just before the first charge they'll get rid of them. Samurai will always need swords. In a real battle. Even so, I'm glad you'll never have to use this attack force, or, Josen was going to add, or this filthy, treacherous method of war. Instead, he said, or we'll all have to give our swords away. Perhaps we will, Josen san, when we go to war. You'd give up your Murasama blade? Or even Toranaga's gift? To win a battle, yes. 
otherwise no. Then you might have to run very fast to save your fruit when your musket jammed or your powder got wet. Josen laughed at his own sally. Yabu did not. Omi san! Show him! He ordered. At once Omi gave an order. His men slipped out the short sheet bayonet sword that hung almost unnoticed from the back of their belts and snapped it into a socket on the muzzle of their muskets. Charge! Instantly the samurai charged with their battle cry. Kasajai thee! The forest of naked steel stopped a pace away from them. Josen and his men were laughing nervously from the sudden, unexpected ferocity. Good, very good, Josen said. He reached out and touched one of the bayonets. It was extremely sharp. Perhaps you're right, Yabusama. Let's hope it's never put to the test. Omi san! Yabu called. Form them up. Josen san's going to review them. Then go back to camp. Mariko san, Anjin san, you follow me. He strode down the rise through the ranks, his aides, Blackthorn, and Mariko following. Form up at the path. Replace bayonets. Half the men obeyed at once, turned about, and walked down the slope again. Naga and his two hundred and fifty samurai remained where they were, bayonets still threatening. Josen bristled. What's going on? I consider your insults intolerable, Naga said venomously. That's nonsense. I haven't insulted you, or anyone. Your bayonets insult my position. Yabu-sama. Yabu turned back. Now he was on the other side of the Torunaga contingent. Naga-san. He called out coldly. What's the meaning of this? I cannot forgive this man's insults to my father or to me. He's protected. You cannot touch him now. He's under the cipher of the regents. Your pardon, Yabu-sama, but this is between Josen-san and myself. No. You are under my orders. I order you to tell your men to return to camp. Not a man moved. The rain began. Your pardon, Yabu-san, please forgive me, but this is between him and me and whatever happens I absolve you of responsibility for my action and those of my men. Behind Naga, one of Josen's men drew his sword and lunged for Naga's unprotected back. A volley of twenty muskets blew off his head at once. These twenty men knelt and began to reload. The second rank readied. Who ordered live ammunition? Yabu demanded. I did. I, Yoshinaga no Toranaga. Naga-san. I order you to let Nebra Josen and his men go free. You are ordered to your quarters until I can consult Lord Toranaga about your insubordination. Of course you will inform Lord Toranaga and karma is karma. But I regret, Lord Yabu, that first this man must die. All of them must die. Today. Josen shrieked. I'm protected by the regents. You'll gain nothing by killing me. I regain my honor, nay? Naga said. I repay your sneers at my father and your insults to me. But you would have had to die anyway. Nay? I could not have been more clear last night. Now you've seen an attack. I cannot risk Ishido learning all this. His hand waved at the battlefield. This horror. He already knows. Josen blurted out, blessing his foresight of the previous evening. He knows already. I sent a message by Pigeon secretly at dawn. You gain nothing by killing me, Naga-san. Naga motioned to one of his men, an old samurai, who came forward and threw the strangled pigeon at Josen's feet. Then a man's severed head was also cast upon the ground the head of the samurai, Masamoto, sent yesterday by Josen with the scroll. The eyes were still open, the lips drawn back in a hate-filled grimace. The head began to roll. It tumbled through the ranks until it came to rest against a rock. A moan broke from Josen's lips. Naga and all his men laughed. Even Yabu smiled. Another of Josen's samurai leaped for Naga. Twenty muskets blasted him, and the man next to him, who had not moved, also fell in agony, mortally wounded. The laughter ceased. Omi said, 
Shall I order my men to attack, sire? It had been so easy to maneuver Naga. Yabu wiped the rain off his face. No, that would achieve nothing. Josen San and his men are already dead, whatever I do. That's his karma, as Naga San has his. Naga San, he called out. For the last time, I order you to let them all go. Please excuse me, but I must refuse. Very well. When it is finished, report to me. Yes. There should be an official witness, Yabusama. For Lord Toranaga and for Lord Ishido. Omi-san, you will stay. You will sign the death certification and make out the dispatch. Naga-san and I will countersign it. Naga pointed at Blackthorn. Let him stay too. Also as witness. He's responsible for their deaths. He should witness them. Anjin-san, go up there. To Naga-san. Do you understand? Yes, Yabu-san. I understand, but why, please? To be a witness. Sorry, don't understand. Mariko-san, explain witness to him, that he's to witness what's going to happen then you follow me. Hiding his vast satisfaction, Yabu turned and left. Josen shrieked. Yabu-sama. Please. Yabu-sama. Blackthorn watched. When it was finished he went home. There was silence in his house and a pall over the village. A bath did not make him feel clean. Sake did not take away the foulness from his mouth. Incense did not unclog the stench from his nostrils. Later Yabu sent for him. The attack was dissected, moment by moment. Omi and Naga were there with Mariko Naga as always cold, listening, rarely commenting, still second in command. None of them seemed touched by what had happened. They worked till after sunset. Yabu ordered the tempo of training stepped up. A second five hundred was to be formed at once. In one week another. Blackthorn walked home alone, and ate alone, beset by his ghastly discovery, that they had no sense of sin, they were all conscienceless even Mariko. That night he couldn't sleep. He left the house, the wind tugging at him. Gusts were frothing the waves. A stronger squall sent debris clattering against the village hovel. Dogs howled at the sky and foraged. The rice-thatched roofs moved like living things. Shutters were banging and men and women, silent wraiths, fought them closed and barred them. The tide came in heavily. All the fishing boats had been hauled to safety much farther up the beach than usual. Everything was battened down. He walked the shore then returned to his house leaning against the press of the wind. He had met no one. Rain squalled and he was soon drenched. Fujiko waited for him on the veranda, the wind ripping at her, guttering the shielded oil lamp. Everyone was awake. Servants carried valuables to the squat adobe and stone storage building in the back of the garden. The gale was not menacing yet. A roof tile twisted loose as the wind squeezed under an eave and the whole roof shuddered. The tile fell and shattered loudly. Servants hurried about, some readying buckets of water, others trying to repair the roof. The old gardener, Yukiya, helped by children, was lashing the tender bushes and trees to bamboo stakes. Another gust rocked the house. It's going to blow down, Mariko-san. She said nothing, the wind clawing at her and Fujiko, wind tears in the corners of their eyes. He looked at the village. Now debris was blowing everywhere. Then the wind poured through a rip in the paper shoji of one dwelling and the whole wall vanished, leaving only a latticed skeleton. The opposite wall crumbled and the roof collapsed. Blackthorn turned helplessly as the shoji of his room blew out. That wall vanished, and so did the opposite one. Soon all the walls were in shreds. He could see throughout the house. But the roof supports held and the tiled roof did not shift. Bedding and lanterns and mats skittered away, servants chasing them. The storm demolished the walls of all the houses in the village. And some dwellings were obliterated completely. No one was badly hurt. At dawn the wind subsided and men and women began to rebuild their homes. By noon the walls of Blackthorn's house were remade and half the village was back to normal. 
The light lattice walls required little work to put up once more, only wooden pegs and lashings for joints that were always mortised and carpentered with great skill. Tiled and thatched roofs were more difficult, but he saw that people helped each other, smiling and quick and very practiced. Moore hurried through the village, advising, guiding, chiving, and supervising. He came up the hill to inspect progress. Mura, you made. Blackthorn sought the words. You make it look easy. Ah, uh, thank you, Anjin-san. Yes, thank you, but we were fortunate there were no fires. You fires often? So sorry, do you have fires often? Do you have fires often? Blackthorn repeated. Yes. But I'd ordered the village prepared. Prepared, you understand? Yes. When these storms come, Mura stiffened and glanced over Blackthorn's shoulder. His bow was low. Omi was approaching in his bouncing easy stride, his friendly eyes only on Blackthorn, as though Mura did not exist. Morning, Anjin-san, he said. Morning, Omi-san. Your house is good. All right. Thank you. Omi looked at Mura and said brusquely, The men should be fishing or working the fields. The women too. Yabusama wants his taxes. Are you trying to shame me in front of him with laziness? No, Omi-sama. Please excuse me. I will see to it at once. It shouldn't be necessary to tell you. I won't tell you next time. I apologize for my stupidity. Mura hurried away. You're all right today, Omi said to Blackthorn. No troubles in the night? Good today, thank you. And you? Omi spoke at length. Blackthorn did not catch all of it, as he had not understood all of what Omi had said to Mura. Only a few words here, a few there. So sorry. I don't understand. Enjoy? How did you like yesterday? The attack? The pretend battle? Ah, I understand. Yes, I think good. And the witnessing? Please? Witnessing? The Ronin Nebra Josen and his men? Omi imitated the bayonet lunge with a laugh. You witnessed their deaths. Deaths? You understand? Ah, yes. The truth, Omi-san, not like killings. Karma, Anjin-san. Karma. Today trainings? Yes. But Yabusama wants to talk only. Later. Understand, Anjin-san? Talk only later. Omi repeatedly patiently. Talk only. Understand. You're beginning to speak our language very well. Yes. Very well. Thank you. Difficult. Small time. Yes. But you're a good man and you try very hard. That's important. We'll give you time, Anjin-san. Don't worry, I'll help you. Omi could see that most of what he was saying was lost, but he didn't mind, so long as the Anjin-san got the gist. I want to be your friend, he said, then repeated it very clearly. Do you understand? Friend? I understand friend. Omi pointed at himself then at Blackthorn. I want to be your friend. Ah. Thank you. Honored. Omi smiled again and bowed, equal to equal, and walked away. Friends with him? Blackthorn muttered. Has he forgotten? I haven't. Ah, uh, Anjin-san, Fujiko said, hurrying up to him. Would you like to eat? Yabusama is going to send for you soon. Yes, thank you. Many breakings? He asked, pointing at the house. Excuse me, so sorry, but you should say, was there much breakage? Was there much breakage? No real damage, Anjin-san. Good. No hurtings? Excuse me, so sorry, you should say, no one was hurt? Thank you. No one was hurt? No, Anjin-san. No one was hurt. Suddenly Blackthorn was sick of being continually corrected, so he terminated the conversation with an order. I'm hunger. Food. Yes, immediately. So sorry, but you should say, I'm hungry. A person has hunger, but is hungry. She waited until he had said it correctly, then went away. 
he sat on the veranda and watched Yukia, the old gardener, tidying up the damage and the scattered leaves. He could see women and children repairing the village, and boats going to sea through the chop. Other villagers trudged off to the fields, the wind abating now. I wonder what taxes they have to pay, he asked himself. I'd hate to be a peasant here. Not only here anywhere. At first light he had been distressed by the apparent devastation of the village. That storm hardly touched an English house, he had said to Mariko. Oh, it was a gale all right, but not a bad one. Why don't you build out a stone or bricks? Because of the earthquakes, Anjin San. Any stone building would, of course, split and collapse and probably hurt or kill the inhabitants. With our style of building there's little damage. You'll see how quickly everything's put back together. Yes, but you've fire hazards. And what happens when the great winds come? The typhons? It is very bad then. She had explained about the typhons and their seasons from June until September, sometimes earlier, sometimes later. And about the other natural catastrophes. A few days ago there had been another tremor. It was slight. A kettle had fallen off the brazier and overturned it. Fortunately the coals had been smothered. One house in the village had caught fire but the fire did not spread. Blackthorn had never seen such efficient fire fighting. Apart from that, no one in the village had paid much attention. They had merely laughed and gone on with their lives. Why do people laugh? We consider it very shameful and impolite to show strong feelings, particularly fear, so we hide them with a laugh or a smile. Of course we're all afraid, but we must never show it. Some of you show it, Blackthorn thought. Nebra Josen had shown it. He had died badly, weeping with fear, begging for mercy, the killing slow and cruel. He had been allowed to run, then bayonet carefully amidst laughter, then forced to run again, and hamstrung. Then he had been allowed to crawl away, then gutted slowly while he screamed, his blood dribbling with the phlegm, then left to die. Next Naga had turned his attention to the other samurai. At once three of Josen's men knelt and bared their bellies and put their short knives in front of them to commit ritual seppuku. Three of their comrades stood behind them as their seconds, long swords out and raised, two-handed, all of them now unmolested by Naga and his men. As the samurai who knelt reached out for their knives, they stretched their necks and the three swords flashed down and decapitated them with a single blow. Teeth chattered in the fallen heads then were still. Flies swarmed. Then two samurai knelt, the last man standing ready as second. The first of those kneeling was decapitated in the manner of his comrades as he reached for the knife. The other said, No. I, Hirosaki Kenko, I know how to die how a samurai should die. Kenko was a lithe young man, perfumed and almost pretty, pale-skinned, his hair well-oiled and very neat. He picked up his knife reverently and partially wrapped the blade with his sash to improve his grip. I protest Nebra Josen San's death and those of his men, he said firmly, bowing to Naga. He took a last look at the sky and gave his second a last reassuring smile. Sayonara, Tadeo. Then he slid the knife deep into the left side of his stomach. He ripped it full across with both hands and took it out and plunged it deep again, just above his groin, and jerked it up in silence. His lacerated bowels spilled into his lap and as his hideously contorted, agonized face pitched forward, his second brought the sword down in a single slashing arc. Naga personally picked up this head by the hair knot and wiped off the dirt and closed the eyes. Then he told his men to see that the head was washed, wrapped, and sent to Ishido with full honors, with a complete report on Hirasaki Kenko's bravery. The last samurai knelt. There was no one left to second him. He too was young. His fingers trembled and fear consumed him. Twice he had done his duty to his comrades, twice cut cleanly, honorably, saving them the trial of pain and the shame of fear. And once he had waited for his. Dearest friend to die as a samurai should die, self-immolated in pride-filled silence, 
then again cut cleanly with perfect skill. He had never killed before. His eyes focused on his own knife. He bared his stomach and prayed for his lover's courage. Tears were gathering but he willed his face into a frozen, smiling mask. He unwound his sash and partially wrapped the blade. Then, because the youth had done his duty well, Naga signaled to his lieutenant. This samurai came forward and bowed, introducing himself formally. O Suraji Nampo, captain of Lord Toranaga's Ninth Legion, I would be honored to act as your second. Ikomo Tadeo, first officer, vassal of Lord Ishido, the youth replied. Thank you. I would be honored to accept you as my second. His death was quick, painless, and honorable. The heads were collected. Later Josen shrieked into life again. His frantic hands tried helplessly to remake his belly. They left him to the dogs that had come up from the village, 